Um, so without further ado, then let's get started. So I will share my screen. I put together a bit of a slide deck. Um, so apologies, I don't want it to be death by PowerPoint. I do try and avoid too much text, but there is a lot of information to impart here because actually for all this has kind of been branded as a, a, a kind of review of an existing standard, it is fundamentally when you, you look at the detail of it, uh, pretty much a brand new standard in terms of what is assessed and in particular the assessment methodology that's going to be applied. So I think it's really important that we capture it all here um, and that you have an aid memoir as well. So when you share the slides and when you watch the video, you've got a very clear record of what we've discussed and what the key changes are. Okay. So the first thing you'll notice is a slight change in the in the title actually it changed from operation slash departmental manager to operations or departmental manager. So the purpose and benefit today really is quite clear. It's it's for me to be able to give you an overview um, of what the process is for the new assessment plan. Um, but also crucially for you to understand um, our interpretation of it in the way that we will be delivering it and the support that's available to yourselves and also crucially to apprenticeship to apprentices. Okay, so contents wise, we'll start off by um, having a look at what's new in version 1.2 compared with the previous version. Um, then an overview of the assessment components and then a recap on the main points and questions. And I've deliberately kept it quite simple um, so that there's plenty of time for questions and so that we don't kind of confuse things with mountains of unnecessary information. Okay, so what is new in 1.2? I was tempted to do this one as a song, but I thought better of it. So the, the, the key things really are highlighted on the slide here. So the, the main thing you'll notice is that we've gone from five assessment methods um, to just two which I'm sure everybody will agree is um, a very welcome change. Uh, five was far too many. Um, you know, there was a lot of over-assessment in, in the old version. It wasn't very clear which assessment method was supposed to assess which part of the standard. Um, we had things like the professional discussion, which focused on CPD and didn't add any value at all, really, and wasn't assessing any of the, the, the kind of knowledge, skills or behaviours in the standard. So thankfully what's happened is the Trailblazer Group's gone back, they've reviewed it in line with more current policy from the Institute and they've reduced that to two. So we've got two methods um, and within the two methods we have three separate components. Um, so I'll just explain what that is shortly. The other key change is the grading has, has changed quite substantially. So whereas before we had a pass, a merit and a distinction, we now just have a pass and a distinction. So the merit's been removed. Um, and the other key thing, and this is crucially important, is that the pass mark has now been removed. So one of the kind of nuances, I guess, of the, the kind of outgoing ODM assessment plans, the same with the outgoing team leader one as well, was that they had the different grade boundaries within it. And in order to pass, apprentices only had to meet 50% of the learning outcomes, which I don't believe really was ever kind of the intention and certainly isn't aligned to current policy. Um, so that has been reviewed and it's been changed and so there's no longer a 50% pass mark and in, in effect the pass mark is now 100%. So it's really important that you understand that and that apprentices, particularly where you've got mixed cohorts, because I know that can be quite difficult to manage if, if you know, you've got people in the same class, for example, that are being assessed against different versions. It's really important that they understand this apprentices who are assessed against this version they do need to demonstrate that they're competent in all of those knowledge, skills and behaviours. And it's not insurmountable. The assessment plan is pretty clear, actually, as to um, what they need to do to get a pass and to get a distinction in each of the components. Um, but in theory, it's a lot more difficult to get a pass now because instead of 50%, you've got to get 100. But it's quite right. It's in keeping with, with the intention of, of policy. Okay, so I mentioned before, not only do we have the new assessment methods, but we actually have a new suite of, of KSBs within the standard. Yes, broadly speaking, they're, they're similar. Um, some of them will be the same because, you know, operational management is operational management, but it has been refined. So I think it's really important that you pay particular attention to the KSBs within the standard and not just the assessment methods. Um, what can be quite confusing at first when you look at the assessment plan, um, and indeed all of the newer ones are laid out in a similar format, is that we, within it, you'll have a kind of a list of the, the KSBs, so the knowledge, skills and behaviour statements. 
Then you'll also have mapping of the KSPs to each of the individual assessment methods. And then you'll also have pass descriptors and distinction descriptors for each of the methods. So I think the best way to describe this is that the KSBs are what you should be teaching the apprentice in terms of the on-program curriculum, um, because that is, you know, th those are the knowledge, skills and behaviours that the trailblazer group has determined are required to be competent in that role. But when it comes to the endpoint assessment, it's really important that apprentices are aware of um, and to a degree focus on the past descriptors and the distinction descriptors because that's what they will be assessed against. Um, you know, in reality, the, the endpoint assessors sitting down and they've got a matrix in front of them which they use to mark. They're not looking at the KSBs, they're looking at those past descriptors and they're looking at those distinction descriptors. So while I would never advocate teaching to the test, um, being aware of how that test is assessed is absolutely critical to, to the outcome for the apprentice and, and how well they are prepared. Okay, um, the other big thing is there's still a project in there, but when we look at this in a bit of detail um, shortly, that project no longer needs to be fully implemented. Um, it's, it's now described as a project proposal. Um, and I think broadly speaking, that's a, that's a positive move because I think with a lot of endpoint assessments where there are projects that need to be kind of thought up, designed and implemented within a short period of time, it quite often can lead to sort of arbitrary projects that are developed just because an apprentice has to do a project for their EPA. If you've got an employer who've got multiple apprentices on the same standard and they have to then design and time multiple projects all to happen at the same time, it's just not realistic, it's not feasible. And actually the result is that it's not a valid form of assessment um, because it's been engineered purely for the purpose of assessment. Really what we're seeking to do with EPA is to assess how competent somebody is in their job and the more naturally occurring the evidence is the more valid it is and actually the better the experience for the apprentice um, the better the return and investment for their employer um, and the more reliable that assessment outcome is um, so i think that's one of one of the reasons why it's been changed so it's, it's now a project proposal so in essence they need to be very clear as to what they're going to do in their project and they do need to provide evidence and gantt charts and the like but they don't need to see it through to completion if it's not appropriate for them to do so uh, the next big change um, is that the portfolio so it retains a portfolio of evidence um, but it's very clearly not assessed um, and we've had much clearer guidance from both the institute and Ofqual in recent months around what's meant by a non-assessed portfolio and the three key requirements i've captured on the slide there um, number one is it must be a gateway requirement. So along with the English and maths, along with the employer declaration and the rest of it, the portfolio has to be submitted along with gateway documentation, um, which means two things. It means, number one, that the evidence all has to have been generated on program. Um, and number two, it can't be generated kind of once they've gone through gateway. So they submit the portfolio, even if the next day, you know, that involves a really good bit of work, they can't put that in. Once it's submitted, it's submitted. Um, the other key thing is that we can't provide any feedback on the portfolio. Um, so whereas previously we might have um, returned the uh, referencing table with feedback from a, an assessor, that will not be the case um, with, with this or indeed with any standards that have a non-assessed portfolio. Um, the, the portfolio submitted at Gateway, it's used really primarily as a resource for the assessor to um, gather notes, gather thoughts, and formulate the, the types of questions, the types of points that they want to raise and discuss in the PD. Um, and third, and, and finally, and really important point is that the portfolio will have no impact at all, actually, on the final grade, or no direct impact, I should say. So if we get a brilliant portfolio, um, and the apprentice flunks their professional discussion, the likelihood is, is they will fail that component. Conversely, if we get what we would consider to be quite a poor portfolio, but the apprentice performs really well in the professional discussion, they can pass, they can still get a distinction. Um, but that's really important, and I mentioned this on the team leader webinar as well, it's really important though that we don't lose focus on um, the significance of the portfolio in determining a positive experience for the apprentice but also kind of a good outcome in the pd um, because a poor portfolio you know we, we would have no recourse to reject that 
um, unless it were a case that it wasn't mapped to the re to the re requisite KSBs. Um, but even if our assessor felt that the portfolio was very poor, they cannot give that feedback. They cannot reject the portfolio. They have to invite the apprentice to, to the PD. And the reality is, is that PD is going to be a lot more difficult to administer and a lot more time consuming if the evidence that was in the portfolio is not clear or not reliable because the apprentice is going to have to be set in the context for every single one of the discussion points. Whereas if there's a really robust, clear portfolio with a lot of project evidence in and all the rest of it, um, that PD can be a lot more effective, a lot, a lot leaner, if you like, in terms of kind of validating what the what the assessors already saw in the portfolio. So while it wouldn't be formally assessed, in reality, a good portfolio will likely lead to a good outcome. A bad portfolio will likely lead to a bad out outcome. Um, and the final point there in terms of the key things that have changed, um, which I alluded to before, is that the, the individual knowledge, skills and behaviours are now pre-mapped to each component. Um, and this is a kind of a feature now of all of the new assessment plans. And it is so much better. Um, I'm sure everybody will agree, especially if kind of you've delivered kind of old and newer versions of plans, especially if you've looked at this assessment plan in detail. Um, it's so much better because I think one of the real flaws previously was that it wasn't really clear at all to an endpoint assessor. It wasn't very clear to a coach. It wasn't very clear to an apprentice what was going to be assessed in each of the methods. It was a bit of a free for all. Um, and while I think that that kind of um, flexibility can be a positive thing, actually overwhelmingly in my experience, what apprentices crave is a bit of structure and a bit of clarity. So I think having those pre-mapped from the beginning is a very positive thing indeed. And what it also does is prevents that that um, risk of, of over-assessment where you've got a, a KSB that's been assessed multiple times across multiple components. It's not what we're seeking to achieve. Um, and it, it's not the way that we want to deliver endpoint assessment. So all in all, I think some major changes there actually between the old version and the new version. Ostensibly, it's more difficult because it's 100% past mark rather than 50, but I think that that's the right decision. Um, I think it's the right direction of travel. And collectively, when you look at all of those changes, I think kind of everybody would agree that, you know, overwhelmingly, they're very, very positive. And what we've got now is a much better standard and a much better assessment plan. Okay, um, so the assessment components. So just a quick overview, we've got two methods um, and, and I've noted the terminology used in the assessment plan um, and also noted that I used the wrong term on my previous slide. So I'll correct that before sharing it. Um, but the Institute describes um, a method as kind of the overarching assessment method. So a professional discussion is method one and the project, if you like, is method two. Now within a method, you can have multiple components um, and each of the components is assessed. So method one is a professional discussion which is underpinned by a non-assessed portfolio of evidence. So because that portfolio is not assessed, the only assessed component is the PD. So it's one method, one component, which is a professional discussion underpinned by a non-assessed portfolio. And the second method is the project, um, which is divided into two assessed components. So the first of those is the project proposal, which is a written document backed up with product evidence. Um, and the second component within that method is a presentation and, and questioning session, um, which is delivered remotely by the apprentice to the assessor um, and is an hour in duration maximum. Those two methods can be taken in any order. Um, so, you know, if if the apprentice wanted to um, kind of submit the project proposal and do the presentation first um, and then do the PD later, they can. I think, to be honest, the way that I can see it probably working is the other way around. Um, and most apprentices, because of it, they're submitting that portfolio at Gateway, they can get the professional discussion done you know, relatively quickly, get that grade under their belt, um, and in the meantime can be working on the project because they have 12 weeks to, to develop that project proposal, which we will look at very shortly um, because the next slide, we're going to look at those two assessment methods in a little bit more detail. Okay, so we'll start with the professional discussion. So as I've mentioned a couple of times now, it's based on a non-assessed portfolio of evidence. 
Um, as ever, the DSW toolkit will um, include some guidelines around the recommended evidence types. Now, there are some um, kind of rules, if you like, in, in inverted commas within the assessment plan around the, the, the makeup, the constitution of the portfolio types of evidence for example it says there can be video in there but it's a maximum of 20 minutes now in reality there are guidelines rather than rules um, by virtue of the fact that we don't assess the portfolio and we can't reject it um, so while kind of you, you don't necessarily have to adhere to those guidelines we would strongly recommend that you do because the good practice guidelines around um, showcasing the best bits of evidence um, mapping the evidence effectively um, I think apprentices invest in that bit of time in advance will result in a better outcome or, or certainly a better experience for them because the assessors, you have to always remember the assessors don't know the apprentice. They're not familiar with their business or their work. Um, they assess a lot of these things. So, you know, if, if you if you put yourself in that mindset of, okay, I'm on to a hundredth assessment now of these portfolios, what are you going to do as an apprentice to make your evidence really stand out? Um, and the way to make it stand out is to only put the best bits in. Um, so showcasing, you know, where, where, you, where you really excelled and also just making it really clear in terms of the mapping. So, you know, the last thing an assessor wants is to spend hours and hours trips through trying to find bits of evidence, you know, really you're trying to make a good impression on the assessor as an apprentice. Okay, um, so an important note there as well, which is made very clear in the assessment plan, which again, I think is very positive, is that both the apprentice and the assessor can take their own copies of the portfolio into the PD. So I would strongly recommend that apprentices are encouraged to do that. They might want to take in their full portfolio. They might want to just take in kind of, you know, an overview sheet. Um, they might want to take in the mapping document that they've done. They might want to take in the list of the KSBs that they know are going to be assessed in, in that PD. They can take any and all of those documents in. Um, if nothing else, it acts as a safety blanket for them. One bit of advice I always give to apprentices um, going into a PD or into to an interview for endpoint assessment is um, there are no curveballs. There are no, there aren't gonna be any difficult questions in there. There aren't gonna be any trick questions. You are not gonna be assessed against anything that you haven't been pre-warned about. It literally tells you in that assessment plan um, and in the DSW toolkit, what you'll be assessed against in that PD. Um, so if they're prepared and if they've got a good portfolio and they take their notes in and you've run through mocks with them and things, there's no reason why that shouldn't be a good outcome for them. Okay, uh, the professional discussion itself delivered remotely, so it's not typically done face to face. Um, we can facilitate that if needed, obviously not at the moment, um, but in the future. Uh, it's between the apprentice and the assessor only, so there aren't any other members. There's no panel there. Um, the apprentice can't kind of take their line manager or the coach in with them. Um, it will last 60 minutes, and it does use the term must, so it says it must last 60 minutes. So that is something that we would have to strictly enforce as an endpoint assessment organisation with a maximum of 10% extra time, and that's at the discretion of the assessor. Um, what it also says in there is that that 10%, it's described as being there for apprentices to finish their last point, I believe. Um, so it's it's not a case of, okay, you, get this, you just arbitrarily get an extra kind of six minutes. It's just that if the assessor feels the apprentice is kind of on a roll, they're on the last bit, they're doing really well, they don't want to cut them short, they can afford them that little bit of extra time. Um, but I think this is where the mocks are really important that apprentices have to kind of try and time it so that they're, they're filling that 60 minutes and they're talking about relevant stuff and then more importantly than anything not going over the time because once they get to that 66 minute mark the assessor will have to kind of call it call it to a halt and grade them on what they've seen and heard so far um obviously um with kind of reasonable adjustments um if there are apprentices that have any specific needs then we can look at, at things like giving them extra time they're dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. One of the strange things in the assessment plan, I guess, which you might have noticed, is that it talks in relation to the professional discussion about endpoint assessment organisations developing a bank of questions. Um, and I think that term question is a bit of an, an odd one because it would imply that that this is an interview or a Q&A session, which of course it isn't. It's a PD. Um, so it's just a word of caution not to be thrown off by that, that word question. I think in reality, it is 
almost a question bank. It's almost kind of a, a bank of discussion points, if you like, but questions are often the best way to start an open discussion with an apprentice. Um, but it's, it's important to note that this is not a Q&A session. It's not an interview. It is a professional discussion, so it should be organic. Um, really, the, the assessor, what they're seeking to do is to kind of point the apprentice in a particular direction, but the onus really is on the apprentice to understand kind of, okay, I'm being pointed in this direction. This is what I'm going to talk about. And if, again, if they're familiar with those outcomes and they're prepared, then, then that should be, be, be relatively easy. But we are required as an EPO to develop this question bank. Um, and from that bank, the, um, the assessor will ask a minimum of six questions. Um, and those questions can actually be tailored um, depending on what the what the assessor's seen in the portfolio, and the assessor can ask kind of follow ups if the if there's a point that the thing's interesting, or if they think oh, the apprentice didn't quite get it there, and I'll give them another bite of the cherry, if, you know, give give them a bit of a prompt, but obviously not not kind of leading them down a particular path. There's a, a delicate balance there. Um, that, to be honest, I mean, that's the way it's described in the assessment plan. That's pretty much the way that we've always kind of designed and delivered it anyway, is that having that core bank of questions um, provides the, the kind of comparability and the reliability, um, whereas you do need to afford the assessor um, some discretion, you know, using their professional judgment um, in terms of tweaking the question and asking any follow-ups. I think you get the best of both worlds. So you start with a, a core bank of questions where you always ask the same or similar, and then the assessor uses their judgment to, to ask follow-ups. I think that is the best design. That's the way it's been designed in the assessment plan. That's the way we'll continue to deliver it. Um, but the last two points there on the PD. So it's graded as um, a fail, a pass, or a distinction. Um, and there's no uplift. So what I mean by that is, um, if the if the apprentice passes the professional discussion, um, but then within say their presentation in the next component, they provide some evidence that would have had they said it in the professional discussion got them a distinction. That doesn't mean the assessor goes back and awards the distinction. Each component has to be graded individually um, because it is an aggregation that's used to determine the final uh, outcome. Um, and I am assured of that as a as as being the appropriate response because we have attended numerous um, standardization sessions with, with the EQA provider and other endpoint assessment organizations. And they have made it clear with other standards that where you have individually graded components, although there is an, an element of holistic assessment within each component or within each method, each method is actually um, graded individually. And once you get a pass, you can't then go back and say, oh, it's a distinction because they did really well in the presentation. Okay. Right. Uh, so that's that's um, assessment method one, and assessment method two is the more unusual one, I guess, is probably a fair way of describing it, um, which is the project proposal. So as I mentioned, it's it's a single method broken down into two components. So the two components are a project proposal, which is a written document, and then a presentation and question, which is a one-to-one -one session between the apprentice and the endpoint assessor. The um, the apprentice can't start their project proposal until they've gone through gateway, um, and at which point they will submit a, a kind of a summary proposal, which is around 500 words. We will have within the toolkit um, a template for that summary proposal, as well as a template for the, the final proposal as well, um, and that'll be made available to apprentices. Now, um, I've picked a couple of just phrases there from the assessment plan. Um, just to, to demonstrate what the project kind of is um, and what the parameters are for it, I guess. And, and I think these are really important because quite often with EPA, we see projects that are not necessarily a project per se in the truest sense of the word. Quite often, actually, they might be just the description of business as usual activity. And it might be really good business as usual activities. Some we've seen some excellent ones, you know, during the, the pandemic, um, whereby you know organizations have been short staffed, people have stepped up and taken on additional responsibilities. That's great evidence that, that should go in the portfolio, but that's probably not a project. Um, and, and I think the definitions that I've pulled from the assessment plan here are, are critical. 
Um, so it must be a relevant and defined piece of work. And that defined piece of work to me is the key bit. So it needs a start and it needs an end. It needs measurable outcomes. It needs all of the things that you'd expect the project at level five to have. Um, so, you know, that kind of formal official documentation, stakeholder mapping, risk analysis, Gantt charts, project initiation document, report mechanisms. It is that serious. It is a proper project that they're required to do here. Um, and I think particularly as the number of assessment methods has been consolidated down to, to two, the project now holds more weight and more significance even than it did before. Uh, apprentices working on this standard at this level in this occupation should absolutely have access to kind of, um, you know, genuine projects that they can do as part of their EPA with the added, added benefit now that they don't have to fully implement that project. So the, the key phrase is in there, relevant defined piece of work with a real business benefit. Um, and the detailed project implementation, implementation proposal will enable, that will enable the project to be fully implemented. So again, that proposal and that fully not fully implemented are, are really important points as I described before and for the reasons I described before. Now it might be that, that they do finish the project, that it is something that can get done in the 12 weeks, great. That's fantastic. Um, it might be that they get part of the way through it and, and you know, they get to the end of the 12 weeks equally fine. Um, it might be that actually they design it all, they've got all the product evidence, but they don't get a chance to kind of get, get past the first hurdle. They're all fine, provided that the, the required KSPs um, are met and those passing distinction descriptors where relevant are met or the past descriptors are. Um, we won't get hung up on kind of how far down the line the project is. Just the, the main things are it's a genuine project and the evidence is in there to support the KSBs that are being purported to be met. Um, but it specifically pulls out four KSBs um, which are assessed as part of that project proposal. Now, when you look at the in the assessment plan and in the toolkit that we'll, we'll give you kind of hopefully later, later this, this month, um, it will tell you um all of the ksbs that are assessed for that method but there is this additional bit that's in the assessment plan which says the implementation of the project proposal must begin during the epa period um i.e they can't kind of start the project before they go through gateway that's critically important if they do it will become kind of ineligible as a piece of evidence they would have to start a new project and we do need to be quite strict on that um but it goes on to say it must ensure that S1.2, 2.1, 2.2, 3.1 can be assessed and progress against these skills, sorry, and progress against these skills must be discussed during the presentation. Um, so for that reason, I've highlighted those, those kind of four skills, um, but it's really important to note that those three are specifically kind of focused on within the assessment plan and that they must be discussed during the presentation. So when the apprentices are preparing for the presentation, they should focus on those skills. But obviously in the, the updated version of this and in the toolkit, they'll have the relevant ones. Um, if, if you need to refer to it, it's in the assessment plan as well as S3.1. Okay. So the project proposal, um, as I say, it's a written document in essence um, of 4,000 words. It must be started and completed after the apprentice has gone through Gateway. It has to be done within 12 weeks of Gateway. Um, so it's not a case of, okay, the apprentice goes through gateway, they're approved and they say, I'm going to start this project proposal in a month's time. The clock starts ticking as soon as that gateway is approved. Um, so timeliness is really important um, and, and that should be factored in from the beginning. Um, I've added a bit in there because I often get asked this question about projects and where it's a post gateway project. Now, in reality, a lot of projects will be based upon and reliant upon research and data. Um, and in some instances, it may well be that the research and the data that underpins a project is research and data that was carried out kind of at an earlier stage. So I've, I've put that in bold there where appropriate, because I think the default position shouldn't be, oh, great, let's, uh, let's start doing a load of research and data analysis now because it will be easier to do the project later on. It's where there's a genuine case of, right, you're doing a project and actually I did this bit of research or a colleague did this bit of research earlier on and it's really useful. You can use that research and you can refer to that research and data in the proposal. Now, important to note as well, the presentation has to be submitted alongside the proposal. 
So within that 12 weeks, they submit the proposal document and also a copy of their presentation. Um, if they don't submit the presentation with the proposal, they'll fail the component and have to start again. Uh, the proposal is um, 4,000 words. Now, this is dictated within the assessment plan. It doesn't include references and annexes. Um, and there is a tolerance there of 10% um, plus and minus. So what that means is that if we get um, a project proposal in that's kind of outside of that 10% boundary, um, one of two things will happen. So if it's more than 10% under it will fail. Um, so if we get a project proposal in the 3,000 words, it will just instantly fail. Um, if it is over, um, it will also fail. Um, so if it's 4,500 words, um, sorry, it won't fail. If it's over, the, the assessor will stop counting when they get to the, the 4,400 words. So if an apprentice puts in a proposal that's 4,500 words, the assessor will still mark it um, but they'll just effectively stop reading once they get the 4,400 because that's the maximum that they can allow. Okay, um, now another stipulation assessment plans that that proposal has to be completed unaided. Um, so they shouldn't seek any support from the coach or the line manager or anybody else in developing and writing that proposal. It has to be their own work um, and assessors will be kind of checking that when they mark it. Um, you should, the apprentice should include product evidence and that's detailed actually in the, the bullet points that we're about to look at. That's taken from the assessment plan, so it's really useful to have that clarification. Um, and within our toolkit, we will provide a template, as I say, for that kind of project outline, which is the smaller 400 word, 500 word document, but then also for this project proposal, which is the big one that they submit as part of their assessment. Um, and the, the, uh, Assessment plan also says that there should be a statement of support from leadership. Um, so effectively, the apprentice employer saying, yes, this is a genuine project. Um, we will give the apprentice whatever support they need to complete it. Um, so rather than that being submitted as a letter or an email in addition to it, what we'll do is we'll just build that in to that template that's within the toolkit. So everything's in one place and it's easier to manage for everybody. Um, and it will also, within the template for the, the project proposal, there are specific things that are outlined in the assessment plan that the project proposal should cover. Um, so we will include those in the template and the toolkit, just so that there's real clarity and real structure there for apprentices so that they can be confident that when they submit their project, it, it ticks all of those boxes, if you like. And the things that it has to cover are um, an executive summary, an introduction, the scope of the project, including KPIs, objectives, a project plan. Um, so that includes things like Gantt charts, risk issue mitigation, um, RACI matrix and things like that. Um, details of how the project outcomes will be achieved. Um, so obviously they don't need to actually achieve all of those outcomes if it's a project that didn't kind of see it all the way through to complete um, implementation. Uh, comments from the apprentice on the validity of the methods of analysis, data interpretation and data presentation used. Um, I mean, I won't read through all of those. You, you've got this here as an a memoir, but I wanted to put them on the slide here just to draw your attention to the importance of them, because as they are listed in the assessment plan, they are kind of mandatory components of that proposal. Um, and they are things that the assessor will be looking for when they're carrying out that assessment. Okay. So component one of the project is the project proposal. So that's the, the 4,000 word written proposal. Now the next step is the presentation and questions. Um, now this will take place at least two weeks after the proposals um, submitted, um, which gives the, the assessor time to formulate kind of um, relevant questions. And again, I've taken a statement there from the assessment plan just to provide real clarity, which is the purpose of the question is to seek clarification of the proposal or presentation to assess the depth and breadth of knowledge, skills and behaviours and to assess those KSPs that the apprentice did not have the opportunity to demonstrate with the proposal, although these should be kept to a minimum. Um, so what that tells you is that in actual fact, where the KSPs are mapped into the project proposal in the toolkit, and in the assessment plan, the apprentice should seek to meet all of those in that project proposal. If they do that, the presentation and question session is going to be 
a, a lot more comfortable for them actually and they're, they're going to be more likely to get a better outcome um, again there's, there's no panel here it'll be delivered online um, to the endpoint assessor by the apprentice um, there's again a bank of questions so um, the the endpoint assessor will ask a minimum of eight questions um, based on a list that's provided in the assessment plan and the next slide again I've listed those just for the sake of clarity what's interesting is I'm pretty sure when you look at the list there'll be um, you'll see that there are nine <laughs> points in there so minimum of eight questions in reality is going to be a minimum of nine questions if there's one per point um, and again the questions are from a bank that we will provide to assessors but the assessors can use their discretion to tailor follow-ups to tailor the question sorry and to ask follow-ups um, the total duration for this component is 60 minutes and again you have that plus 10 percent at the discretion of the assessor and it says an assessment plan typically um, so we'll have to kind of see how this works in practice, to be honest, before we kind of strictly enforce it. Um, but typically the expectation is that the presentation is 20 minutes and the Q&A is 40 minutes. So how that ratio works and how that split works um, is something that we'll, we'll, we'll monitor and work with you on. Um, but what we can't change is that total maximum duration because that is set out in the assessment plan. So it's 60 minutes. And again, with the 10 minutes discretion. Now that 10, 10 sorry, 10% 10 discretion, that 10%, so that six minutes, that can be split between the presentation and the Q&A. It's not to say that it has to be the Q&A only. So actually, if the presentation goes over, it's fine, so long as overall they remain within that 10% tolerance. Okay. So I mentioned before that there are the specific areas that the assessment plan says must be covered in the presentation and questioning, and I've listed them here. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, so there are nine. So it's a bit weird that it says eight questions, um, but based on, on nine points, unless, of course, we combine some of those points together. Again, I won't read through those, but they're just there for a new memoir just to draw your attention to them. So... How are we doing time wise? So 22, so it made good time. I'll just recap on this and then um, answer any questions that anybody may have. So the key things are we've gone from five assessment methods to two. Um, across those two methods, there are a total of three components. So we have the portfolio based professional discussion, an hour. We have a written project proposal, which is backed up with product evidence. This is 4,000 words. And then we have a presentation and questions, which are based on the project proposal total of 60 minutes um, delivered online. The pass mark's now 100%, it's not 50 anymore. The portfolio isn't assessed. Uh, the project has to be a real genuine project, not kind of business as usual activity, no matter how good that is, um, but it doesn't have to be fully implemented. Um, so the apprentice can kind of kickstart the project and, and not have the opportunity to complete it, provided it's a real project, provided that they give the evidence to demonstrate that they're competent against those KSBs, they can and should pass. Um, we will provide you with the toolkit. I mentioned before, we're looking to get that out um, this side of Christmas. Uh, so we're working on that at the moment. Um, and within the toolkit, we'll have kind of the, the usual suite of resources. Um, which includes um, kind of examples, mock questions for the PD in the presentation, templates for the project proposal, uh, reference and documents for apprentices to map their evidence and so forth. Um, and then the last point, which I mentioned earlier, we're not teaching to the test. I'm definitely not encouraging anybody to teach to the test. It's important to teach to the KSBs, but be aware that the, the, the grade will be aligned to the past descriptors and the distinction descriptors um, which are almost in a narrative format within within tables. They're in the assessment plan. They will be in the toolkit. So make sure that apprentices are really familiar with those. Um, and in addition to those, I would also check those bullet points because because they're they're listed in the assessment plan. They are things that we need to factor into the assessment decision. So I've talked myself dry there. <laughs> so I will. Um, stop the presentation now and invite kind of any any questions that anybody might have um jake one yeah. one has been sent through um saying should the portfolio provide evidence to cover all skills or or only the ones covered by the professional discussion good question uh, only the ones covered by the professional discussion 
Okay, so I've got a couple more questions coming through. Um, mm -hmm. great. So um, Lena's asked, um, when is the new assessment plan effective from? Um, she has learners who have started their program in October 2019. Okay, so the, the the latest version of the assessment plan was published, I believe, on the 21st of October. Um, so the rules say that any apprentices who start their program, um, i.e. are registered on, on the ILR, um, they must be assessed against the new version when they come to endpoint assessment. Um, where we have flexibility is in terms of any apprentices who were registered prior to that point. Um, once we've developed the collateral and we've, we've built the, the EPA on um, our systems and things like that, you have the option um, of apprentices to do either the old version or the new version. Um, and I think there are a lot of factors, actually, it's quite a difficult decision to make um, because on the one hand, it's, it's more difficult, to be honest, um, because it's gone from 50% to 100%. But on the other hand, in terms of actually the, the efficacy as a, as a reliable assessment method I think is much greater now than it was before. Um, just a question there from Pamela, I've just saw pop up around the 100% pass mark. Yeah, so so the way that the the kind of the old versions I'll call them, so the ones that are on the way out, the way that they were designed is that they, um, the, the Trailblazer group said that in order to pass a, an individual component within that, an apprentice just had to get 50%. Um, so in reality, what it meant was that apprentices could, in any component and therefore across the whole EPA, they could essentially fail half of the outcomes. Um, so if we take probably probably the MCQ is a, a clearer way of, of articulating that. So within the MCQ, so the multiple choice question paper, let's say for, for ease, there are 100 questions in there. Um, the apprentice could... And, and so each of those questions was was mapped against one of the the KSBs. The apprentice could fail half of those questions and still pass. Um, and so if you apply that logic across the whole standard, what it meant was that you know endpoint assessment organisations were forced really to to give people passes when in fact they were only kind of half competent. But now, because we have overarching pass descriptors within the assessment plan and within the toolkit that's what the, assess the apprentice is being assessed against. So the, the apprentice will have to meet every single one of those past descriptors in order to pass each of the assessment methods. Um, it's not insurmountable, to be honest. Um, it's, it's not unfair um, because it is kind of a vocational, it's a competence-based assessment, um, and they do have full transparency in terms of what's in the toolkit and what's in the assessment plan, what's going to be assessed. Um, and they are allowed to develop and provide kind of evidence over a period of time, both in the portfolio and in the project. Um, so it shouldn't be insurmountable for somebody who's who's engaged and who's competent and, and willing to give it a, a good shot. Um, Jake, there was another question that's come through mm -hmm. from Anthony saying, um, did you say at the start there was no need for a, a CPD? Yeah, that's that's correct. It's a good question. Um, so one of the assessment methods within the old version was was a professional discussion, but that professional discussion focused purely on CPD, and it was really odd because um, it wasn't assessing directly any of the kind of KSBs within the standard. Um, now CPD, I think CPD logs and evidence of CPD will continue to be useful evidence to put within the portfolio and it might then be picked up as part of the professional discussion but there will no longer be a pd that focuses specifically and solely on cpd as a component yeah i'm just looking at the assessment plan there so um it doesn't make any mention of cpd specifically in terms of the evidence that's required from apprentices but as i say i mean cpd can be a really good piece of evidence to put in the portfolio and it can be a good discussion starter as well for for the, the assessor um so kathy posted a question so if the pass is 100 percent, how do you get a distinction so in order to pass um the apprentice will need to meet all of the past descriptors that are described in against that method um so i'll tell you what i'll do actually i'll just share my screen i'll bring the assessment plan up and i'll share screen just a bit easier to explain i think if you can see it okay so 
within the assessment plan, and again, this will be in the toolkit, you'll have um, the section which is called grading descriptors, and then it lists each of the individual assessment methods, and then it describes what an apprentice must do to pass and get a distinction. So each, each assessment method is always underpinned by a specific set number of KSBs, so they'll be in the, in the channel here. But from a preparedness point of view, it's kind of better to focus on actually this column here and this this column here on the right. Um, because when the assessor's reviewing the, the professional discussion and they're going through and they're marking and when they listen to the recording afterwards, this is what they're marking them against. They're not marking them against these KSBs, they're marking them against these past descriptors. So in order to pass the professional discussion, the, the apprentice is gonna have to demonstrate the evidence that's described for all of these within this table. So all of them, so that's the that's where the 100% pass mark comes in. Um, but again, that might sound daunting at first, but if the apprentice is kind of familiar with this and they've built a portfolio and they go in with their portfolio, there's no reason they shouldn't pass. It's almost going like going into a job interview and knowing exactly what questions you're going to be asked up front. Um, it's all about kind of being prepared and, 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 you know, understanding that there's not going to be any question in there that doesn't assess something beyond this. There's no point in, in the assessor asking any questions outside of that range. It doesn't add any value. Um, and so to answer the question, in order to get a distinction, the apprentice must meet all of these past descriptors and they must meet all of the distinction descriptors that are in the column on the right. Obviously, there are fewer distinction descriptors, but they're, they're more demanding than the past ones are. Okay, just, and there looks quite a few in the chat there, so I'll just kind of read through. Yeah, that's a really good observation from Philippa. So um, I read in the new assessment plan that no reflective accounts are allowed in the portfolio. Is this true? So this is, yeah, I, we were very alarmed when we kind of first noted that. And that is something that wherever you have one of the newer assessment plans that has a portfolio in, it will always be a non-assessed portfolio and there will always be a stipulation that it shouldn't contain reflective accounts. Um, now, in reality, I think, what 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 they're trying to avoid there is the assessor just being given a load of anecdotal evidence from the apprentice where they've just appraised their own performance um because it's not that valuable and it is subjective obviously by its nature um now i think there's something in the terminology here because when we've always talked about reflective statements um, and given templates and things in the toolkit, I think actually what we're describing is more of a more of a personal statement, really, or, or a case study than a reflective statement. So it's less about the apprentice reflecting on, on what they did and what they might do differently, because that will come out in the in, in the professional discussion. But I think what will continue to be really useful for the apprentice and for the assessor is if in the portfolio, rather than just a load of product evidence is some form of narrative that 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 pulls that evidence together and tells the story um because i think that's really useful to the assessor so you know it might be a case of right uh i had to deal with this transformation within the business and these were the key things so rather than reflecting on it and saying oh i think i did really well or oh, oh, i was rubbish at this bit it's more just providing that narrative i think that continues to be really important because it helps the assessor to understand what they're looking at in terms of the evidence it helps to refresh the apprentice's memory of of what that activity was and what it entailed and it also provides kind of glue really that that holds all of those bits of evidence together rather than just opening a portfolio and seeing you know 50 copies of emails and presentations and stuff which quite, can be quite difficult to piece together and doesn't always tell that compelling story that we talked about earlier on of, of providing that real showcase um so shorter shorter answer to that is we will probably not call them reflective statements moving forward but we will put in a template in the toolkit and encourage apprentices to provide some form of a narrative alongside the evidence that's in there. So it's really clear to the assessor what it is that they're looking at. Okay. Um, ba -ba -bum. So the question from Pamela. So explain 100% pass mark. So I think I covered that. Why does the project have to be done in the 12 week window? Um, we work with doctors in the NHS who have capacity various times and I can envisage learners taking breaks in the 12. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I can visit learners taking breaks as the 12 weeks period falls in a busy window. Additionally, you have to complete projects as part of their professional training 
which often works well for LMM project to avoid duplicating effort. How do we make this work? Um, this is one of the eternal challenges, I guess, with projects within EPA. I think on the one hand, projects can be one of the best methods of assessment because they, if they're done right, produce lots of naturally occurring evidence. They can help the apprentices to be really engaged. They deliver a return on investment for the employer. The issue is always in the kind of the administration of it, I guess, and in particular the, the time scales. And what you've described there is, is exactly what we hear all the time um, around the difficulty of kind of shoe, shoehorning a project in within a, a constrained period of time and the reality of how well that works um, on the ground and when an employer is kind of, you know, working in somewhere like the NHS when there are multiple priorities all over the place um the, the fact is however once it's in the assessment plan and it's published like that that that's what we have to adhere to um i think the the beauty of this one really is that is that or, or i guess the flexibility within it is is the fact that they don't have to complete the project um but i totally get that actually it might it might still there might still be challenges towards doing the, the project proposal even within that time frame um unfortunately kind of it is what it is um we will continue to seek feedback though and if if we're consistently hearing that you know this is a problem we can always feed that back to, to the equap um and if we gather evidence of that and if other endpoint assessment organizations report the same things back generally speaking we can kind of make make tweaks and improvements um, and last question, part of that question was to get a distinction of effectively graded greater than 100%. Um, that's one way of describing it, yeah. So they have to get the 100% pass mark, um, but the, the distinction descriptors are an entirely different set of descriptors that they need to meet in addition to the pass. So, yeah. Okay. Um, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, Darren agreeing with Pamela. Again, Darren, I think if if that's borne out to be an issue in in kind of real terms and reality then let us know um we are kind of you know beholden to what's in that plan and there are very few changes in reality that we can make we can be flexible and pragmatic um but when it comes to things like timelines generally we can't budge on them um kathy is it they give a fuller better quality answer for a distinction yeah and that's a really important distinction actually <laughs> excuse the pun um is that the distinction what we're not looking for is just more of a pass we are looking to see that higher level of understanding and analysis um and application um so it's not just somebody that worked harder necessarily it's somebody that that worked harder and also was more capable more competent um, and you know it should really be reserved for kind of the the top sort of 10 15 percent of apprentices yeah <laughs> by agreeing with my point on the reflective statement yeah it adds massive value for all sorts of different reasons so yeah we'll continue with that um so kelsey read the project proposal backed up by product evidence this is mean an appendix can be included for reference but would we not be yeah that's right so um the the assessment plan does make make reference to appendices and references um but it is very clear that they don't count as part of the four thousand words um and then one from robert i should think the last one is do we have a limit on audio time within the portfolio and can you advise um on how best to use witness testimonies at all so the the i did look in the assessment plan because i noted that it said 20 minutes max for video but it didn't make reference from what i can see to um audio so i don't know if the 20 minutes is because that's designed to um reduce the burden on assessors or if it's because the videos can prove because because they use quite a lot of memory they can be quite tricky when you know uploading stuff but I think we'll continue to apply our usual rules around audio, which um, we will be given some clearer advice around actually, but generally speaking, um, for anything up to and including level five, we would um, accept a maximum of up to an hour. I think I'll have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure it's up to an hour total of, of audio recordings. Um, where the audio recordings seem to work best is where they're short and snappy, so kind of 10 minutes, 20 minutes maximum um and because they tend to be really focused on a particular area or on a set of ksbs the ones that are longer can be difficult to assess frankly they can be a bit boring to listen to 
um, and they can be more difficult to, to map. Um, the audio, particularly the longer audio recordings, should have timestamps in to show where particular KSBs are, are met. However, I do understand and agree with the argument that quite often, because it's a discussion, it can be quite holistic in nature, quite organic. So it's not always a case of, oh, I'm in one, I talked about this, minute five, I talked about that. Um, but where possible, do try and map it, because again, it just makes it clearer for the for the assessor. Um, and more likely that the apprentice will, will meet the outcome, to be honest. Um, and the second part of that was what advice on, on using witness testimonies. So yeah, really important one. I think I think we did a, a webinar on it actually. So if you have a check on our YouTube channel, it'll be on there. But the key things with witness testimonies are um, make sure that they're specific. We see so many where they're really glowing accounts actually from a line manager, for example, about an apprentice, but it will be from a broad, and, and it won't talk about any specific activities that they witnessed. It will be more just like a kind of generic appraisal of that person. Of, they always turn up on time. They're really friendly. Everybody loves them. They work really hard. That's not very kind of insightful. It's not very useful to an assessor. What the witness testimony should do is focus on specific activities that the apprentice undertook. Um, so really, the witness testimony is often a really good counterpart to a well-written reflective statement. Um, and again, an observation can serve the same purpose. So if it's about a specific set of activities which are mapped to particular outcomes, um, it's going to be more effective actually, and it's going to be more likely to, to result in a, a good grade. Um, recorded witness testimonies, we see more and more of those. Um, again, the same, the usual kind of things around using them, them kind of sparingly and wisely but actually what the the benefit of the recorded witness testimonies is that they quite often i think can produce um more evidence more holistic evidence um because you can kind of cover off quite a lot in a short space of time um the passion of the person can quite often come across um more in a recording than it can in a written witness testimony um, but there's an increased danger of them just kind of going off on a tangent. I think, given the real clear guidance, because quite often I think the person carrying out the witness testimony doesn't really understand what the purpose of it is and how it's going to be used and how it contributes to the assessment. And so they kind of go off on a tangent and there's more risk of that, I think, if it's if it's a recording. Um, so there's a role there for the coach in kind of steering that conversation and keeping it concise and keeping it on track. Okay, um, doo -doo -doo. so Chelsea, you mentioned the assessor should not have input into the presentation. Does this mean no mock presentation will be given to us? Um, I'm not sure I understand that question. Sorry, I don't know if, if whoever posted it can just expand on it. I think I don't know if it's relating to the point that I've made around, which is from the assessment plan, the product proposal, so that the apprentice has to do that independently. I don't know if that's different to the to the presentation point. Sorry, um, but I mean, in, in terms of a mock presentation, it's not something that we've developed. If I'm totally honest, um, but I'll take that feedback on board because we're obviously developing the collateral still now. Um, and if it's feasible for us to produce a mock presentation, then then we, we absolutely will. And um, what we will do is we will provide a list of um, samples, questions. So examples of questions for the professional discussion and also examples of questions that might come up in the presentation. Um, it's, it's easier to do that for the professional discussion um, because it's geared towards the specific case. But I think the presentation is always going to be slightly more tweaked, I think, to, to the content of the presentation rather than the, the, the pre-map KSBs. But yeah, we'll, we'll have a think about that and see. Um, I mean, by all means as well, if you've got any specific requirements or suggestions around support and collateral, let us know because we're more than happy to build it in. Um, so does that mean they can't do a dry run with feedback from us before the real thing? So I think the apprentice can always do a dry run and I would encourage that. So with with the with the presentation, I think if they're uh, I think I get the I think I understand the question now. So I think there's a distinction between the project 
report and the presentation that's a really good question i hadn't i hadn't considered it so i think i might have to go away and ask for clarification from the eqa but i th um I, th I suspect what it is is that the project report has to be done by the apprentice they can't get someone else to kind of co-write it much the same as is like a thesis say for a university project but with the presentation i think i can't see any issue with them say developing that and running it through as a mock um with with, with say their skills coach but let me let me ask that question of the equap and I'll give a really clear answer and we'll build it into the toolkit. Ah, yeah, so you meant the project report. Yeah, so the project report, I think, um, yeah, as I said, I mean, it is really clear in the assessment plan that it says they have to do it without any kind of support from anybody else. Um, I mean, the reality is, is that the assessor's not going to know if, 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 if they have, but obviously there'd be kind of mechanisms in place to... To identify plagiarism and stuff but i mean that's that's clearly not not the point that you make in there um i get that but i think the, the essence is is that it's the apprentice's own work and it shouldn't be something that's kind of written by or contributed to um in any significant way by by somebody else probably not the clearest answer <laughs> but yeah it's, it's one of those ones where we're where we it says it in the assessment plan so we've got to do it in line with that and and if the assessor then gets one and they think this clearly wasn't written by the apprentice then they would kind of take whatever action was appropriate great i think um that might be it with the questions yeah uh there is anthony there is a level three recording available i believe it's on the website um and i know my colleague chelsea will um with a follow-up to this she'll provide a, a link to that one as well so it's easy to access Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for the questions. Thanks for your time um, and have a fantastic day and a great week ahead. And I'll hopefully speak to you all soon. Take care.